Hello and welcome to my <laughs> first ever live Twitch stream. Um, to say I am a little bit nervous is an understatement. I have not done one of these before. Um, this is very much a new thing, but um, I will do my best. I will do my best. So apologies in advance if I um, make any Twitch faux pas in terms of the way I run things or do things or how I interact. So I, I'm, I'm very much on a learning curve here with the whole kind of streaming thing. Uh, not something I'm familiar with, but we will we will crack on. Um, I've been got an hour because um, um, all sorts of stuff. So um, yeah, I've got to make the best use of the time. Um, before I even start, I did want to say a big thank you. Um, I've already seen one of these guys on the stream. Um, so uh, many thanks to Chris Viking and to Suriel08. I uh, don't know the, uh, the the real names behind the usernames, but both of those guys have given me quite a lot of assistance in just getting the stream kind of working and helping me um, um, break through some of the bugs um, <laughs> or just the learning experience of getting the thing up and running. So uh, that's uh, been very much appreciated by me just to kind of help me get started. So that's great. Thank you very much, guys. I uh, really appreciate that. Um, just a little bit, um, as this is kind of my inaugural um, stream, um, kind of a little bit about the etiquette. Um, many of you will possibly be used to streams where, um, you know, we, we, we call it mature content. <laughs> Um, I'm not sure mature is quite the right word sometimes, but anyway, uh, that's what it's called. Um, and I'm, I'm trying to keep this stream open for all ages, um, 
just in case you know, we get some kids along who do want to learn about writing, all that kind of good stuff. So um, I'm going to keep it as a non-mature, if that's the right word. Um, so you'll see that as, a, I think, a warning in the chat. So if you can just keep that in mind when you're posting comments, that would be great. Um, thank you very much for that. Um, the second thing is kind of what is this stream and what isn't it? Um, <laughs> now, some of you, I'm sure, will know me from um, the work I did uh, writing for Elite Dangerous. Now, I'm quite happy to cover um, some stuff about Elite in maybe a, a, you know, a special episode or something, but this isn't primarily about kind of discussing Elite Dangerous related stuff. This is, this is um, <laughs> can I use Farscape swear words? <laughs> Well, actually, to be honest, um, it's probably worth a future session on, um, you know, made up um, cussing and stuff. There are some interesting discussions we could potentially have around that one. So <laughs> we'll see what we can do in that regard. Uh, so that's good. That's a good question. Um, so, yeah, so um, not primarily Elite Dangerous. We may cover that. Uh, I want to kind of focus back on writing itself and, and some of the stuff around that, which is obviously what this stream is supposed to be about. So. Um, so we will definitely take a look at some of those things because obviously a big part of what I have done in the past is writing for computer games, um, Elite Dangerous being one of them. But it's it's not the general focus. Uh, so we'll we'll get to those questions. Uh, yeah, we'll we'll probably do a special on Elite Dangerous at some point in the future. That'd be quite cool. Um, definitely, really, really after interactivity. So if you want to chuck thing into the chat, please do because um, you know I get a buzz out of answering questions and trying to you know, help you guys out. Um, I did post up on one of my blogs a list of sort of topics uh, that I was hoping to kind of cover bit by bit. Um, this evening, I thought we'd stick with, um, so you want to be a writer as a topic. What, what does that mean? What, what, what do you need to kind of bear that in mind? So that's kind of my topic for this evening. But, um, um, you know, if you want to chuck stuff into the chat, if you want to ask questions, um, please do. Um, I may answer some of them as we go. I may defer them to later. Or I may say I'll, I'll, I'll stick them in the future episode, but I will note them down and I will... Um, you know, I will endeavor to do my best. So again, many thanks to Chris and Cyril for helping me set up. The other thing I thought I might do, for those of you who are kind of following me, maybe partly for the books and stuff that I do, then um, no reason why we can't do kind of sneak peeks of upcoming content. Um, obviously, I'm working on writing as we go. So uh, I may even show some of the kind of work in progress stuff as well for some of the stuff. So right now, that's my, um, that's my Shadewood books. Um, and uh, if you're interested in some of that kind of creative process, then uh, we can do that as well. I think that'd be really cool. Um, so um, for those of you who kind of know me through Elite or have come across me, um, you'll probably know a bit of my background. But um, for those of you who don't, and anybody who comes onto this stream kind of after the event, I thought it might be you know, a little bit of potted background on, on who I am. Um, you know, <laughs> why, why am I qualified to even start talking about this topic? Because it's, it, you know, you, you ideally want to be taught or, you know, uh, or helped or, or anything like that by somebody who's got at least hopefully a few credentials in this kind of space. So um, now in terms of actual kind of formal credentials, um, <laughs> I, I have an O-level. Now that dates me horribly. <laughs> So those of you, those of you got GCSEs, it's before that. It's way, way before that. Um, but they're kind of, kind of the same, really. Um, I have an O level in um, English literature from 1986, <laughs> um, and I've only got a C, I'm afraid. So I'm, I'm not even like highly qualified. I have an O level, and that is my only formal writing qualification. I've never been on the course. I have never attended a university, uh, well, have been to university, but not for, um, not for writing. Um, I studied computer science, as it happens. Um, and um, so, you know, in terms of formal qualifications, I don't have any uh, other, than my, other than my prized O-level. <laughs> but I haven't, you know, that hasn't stopped me. That hasn't stopped me writing, and it hasn't stopped me you know, making it a success, hopefully, out of uh, various bits. But, and uh, hello, bog rat. I love this. <laughs> I love some of these names. They're fabulous. Um, a bog rat. Bog rat. Is that right? Something like that. Anyway, that'll do. Um, so, yes, thank you very much for joining the stream. And um, so, yeah, so no formal qualifications at all. But what I have done ever since, um, um, you know, a long, long time ago for me now, and I'm, um, I'm going to be 48 this year, so that just kind of dates you as to roughly how old I am. Um, no, in fact, <laughs> that tells you exactly how old I am. <laughs> um, so, um, yeah, so I'm going to be 48 this, um, this year. And um, I started writing when I was 13. 
And the reason I started writing was because of this computer game that many of you have heard of called Elite. Um, and the reason I um, got writing then was that was the first computer game that ever turned up with a novel inside the kind of packaging. And that novel was a space adventure type kind of, you know, um, young guy saves the princess type story. Nothing particularly imaginative, but it did kind of awaken me up to the fact you could write stories. Um, and I started having a go. And so I, you know, I've actually dug it out. <laughs> so here's a reveal for you. Um, I have um, been fortunate enough that my mum, when she tidied up the attic, um, found a whole bunch of my old stuff and said, do you want it? And I almost, almost got rid of it. Um, fortunately, I didn't, because um, I had to look through the files. And inside the files was this. Um, this is the, the very first story that I ever wrote. And it is written on note paper, very yellowed, as you can see. But it is genuinely the first story I wrote. And it is a complete story for me. It is rubbish, <laughs> I hasten to add, um, certainly by any modern standards. But it's a piece of kind of you know personal archaeology, really. Um, and what it shows to me is that I had started writing back in 1983, 1984, um, and I've never stopped since. I think if you're going to be a writer and you want to be a writer, then you've kind of got to have that um, desire. Um, you, 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 you've got to have a something that is in you that's basically saying, um, I, I've got to write this down. I've just, I've just got to do it and have enough kind of oomph to kind of get you to the end. So um, this, this literally is the first thing I ever wrote, and I'm kind of glad I've got it um, as, a, as a, like I say, a piece of personal archaeology. Um, I won't read it out. It is rubbish. <laughs> In fact, it's the worst kind of teenage angst you can imagine, really, because um, obviously I, you know, my, my counterpart in the game goes and saves the princess, yada, yada, yada. But anyway, um, uh, it made sense at the time. And of course, you have to, you know, there's another cliche coming up. You have to write what you know. Well, you don't, but we'll get to that in a future topic. Um, but um, this, this novel here, obviously unpublished, um, was directly related to the the Dark Wheel novel that came with um, that elite game back in 1983. So I can kind of trace my whole writing thing back to then. So I've been doing that ever since. Um, but, and here's where it gets, you know, kind of, you know, if I had a violin sound effect, I'd put it on, but I haven't got one. Um, is, you know, it gets a bit sad because, and, you know, you may have encountered this in your, um, your life, is that um, you get told what you kind of have to do to be successful. And I was told by my teachers and my parents that, you know, you don't write because it's, you know, that's the stupidest thing you could possibly do because there's no money in it and, you, you know, you'll crash and burn and die of poverty and, you know, <laughs> something horrible happen to you. So get a proper job, get a career. Um, and so I, you know, I was interested in computers at the time. I studied computers and off we went and boom, um, you know, we... Um, uh, you, know, you, you kind of follow that. And, you know, it, that takes up a lot of time. And I drifted away from the writing for a long, long time. And, um, yeah, I said, okay, you know, it's a job, it pays the bills, you get a mortgage, you get married, you have kids and stuff like that. And it wasn't until much, much later on that I kind of got back into writing. And fortunately, I came across, like I say, all these old stuff that I'd written. And ac actually, um, this is, let me just kind of try and pull it out here. Um, this is my complete <laughs> collection of um, stuff that I wrote before word processors were invented. Um, <laughs> so that's um, this is um, this is this is you know it just shows that I was still writing. So some of this actually is word processed. You can see um, very very early sort of um, uh, dot matrix printers and all sorts of stuff in there. So I was still doing it, which is kind of encouraging. And I think that's the first thing I would certainly suggest to you is that you've got to have the willingness to keep going. Even when people tell you it's not worth it or uh, it's not working or you're not making any money out of it or whatever it is that you're kind of being, you know, the obstacle you come up against is, um, is um, you know, you, you've got to push on through it. You really have got to push on through it. Um, oh, and a couple of people. Um, uh, Daddy Hoggy, hello, sir. Good to see you. Thank you very much for joining. Good to. Uh, hope you, I hope your uh, hope your head's not too bad. <laughs> Daddy Hoggy's been raising money for charity in the last couple of days, um, but also drinking copious quantities of beer. So I understand. So sounds like quite a good gig. <laughs> um, that's very good. And Matthew, um, yes. Uh, which authors have most influenced your writing style? I will write that down. Um, 
pen. Oh, I'm an author. Why haven't we got a pen? There we are, pen. <laughs> um, which authors? Yeah, that's a really good question. I will definitely cover that one. That's kind of cool. So um, that was a little bit about me. Um, I'll cover my later stuff uh, at some point, otherwise it sounds a little bit like an advert, um, and I don't want to do that too much, because I wanted to kind of give you, hopefully, some you know, uh, initial value <laughs> from watching the stream. So uh, the question I've chosen for tonight um, is, so you want to be a writer? Question mark. Um, so my first kind of riposte to that is, are you sure? And the reason I'm saying, are you sure, is because um, it's very, very difficult. <laughs> it's sometimes a really, really thankless task. Now, um, you know, take my take my latest book I've just published, um, Lords of Midnight. It took me two years to, to do that, and that's partly because I was busy doing a few other bits and pieces as well. But um, it, um, you know, it, it, it's it's a big job to write anything of any length and to keep the quality and do all the other bits and pieces as well. It's a it's a big job, and somebody. Um, you know, hopefully somebody buys your book and reads it. That's you know, that's always nice. Um, but if um, you know, you you can you can get to the end of that whole process, and somebody can go up on Amazon or Twitter or Facebook and go, nah, it's crap. And that's <laughs> and that's can that can happen after two years of really really hard work. Uh, so you know, you do have to kind of bear in mind what you know. Are, are you sure you're up for this? Because the moment, yeah, you know, lots and lots of people write stuff if you want to put it out there uh, and get other people to look at it and and you're going to have to if you want to write a book there's the you know there's no way around that one you are going to have to put up with you know some thoughtless um or you know brutal or just plain kind of can't be bothered sort of feedback um which can be very very deflating so you know you've got to You've got to appreciate that you're going to encounter some of that. Now, I've been generally quite fortunate that, um, you know, I've, I've had lots of really good feedback. I've had some hard feedback over the time, and I've kind of hopefully learned from it. But it is, you know, that, that first reaction is, is not to be, you know, not to be dismissed. Now, I'm not trying to <laughs> put you off, um, you yeah, know, before we even start this. But yeah, bear that in mind. Bear that in mind. That is important. It's, it's, also, um, it's also quite, you know, it is difficult. Somebody said, um, excuse me, online, that maybe writing is actually one of the hardest things you can do because it's long, long hours. Um, you know, if you're going to write a book, um, let's take my last one. It's about, it, it, it's, it's quite chunky. It's 150,000 words. That is 600,000 bytes, which you actually have to individually type into a computer. <laughs> so it's about, you know, a little bit more than half a megabyte of actual typing. Um, which you know, is, which is a thing. Just, that's just a mechanical thing. So you need to find time for that. Um, I, I must admit, I find it. You know, I can't write in in a noisy environment. I need to have peace and quiet. Um, you know, if you've got a family and all the other bits and pieces that go along with that, you've got to carve out some time for that to make sure that works. So you know, there's some long hours in just the mechanics of doing it. Um, and then there's the then there's the practice bit. Um, <laughs> And um, I've got a link for you, actually, that I'll give at the end of the stream, which is a um, uh, one of the short stories I wrote quite a long time ago, back in 2010, which at the time I thought was brilliant. And all writers think whatever the latest thing is is brilliant, um, until they start realising it isn't. <laughs> <laughs> but what it is, is it, and I, I've deliberately, I've kind of refreshed it, I put a little graphic on it and tied it up a little bit, but I've deliberately not edited it, so you can get a snapshot of what my work looked like eight years ago. And it's quite revealing because there are a lot of kind of classic mistakes in it that at the time I wouldn't have necessarily recognised. And the kind of lesson to take away from that is that you can't just decide today to be an excellent writer. It's like I will, you know, I can't decide today to be an excellent violinist or a pianist or anything really. Um, I can decide that I want to be one uh, at some point in the future, uh, but I need to practice and the only way you can really get better is by having somebody critique you and that was one of the other ideas i was you know kind of potentially going to offer to this if uh, those amongst you and this and you know we'll, we'll try not to be brutal <laughs> we may be a little bit brutal sometimes um but i wanted to offer the opportunity potentially a sort of surgery on this stream that we could take five ten minutes out to 
to read somebody's you know, work and, and give them some very you know, constructive but honest um, feedback. Uh, one of the dangers that you can have uh, when you start out trying to write books is that you send it around to your friends and family and they all say it's fab because they don't want to hurt your feelings. Um, and that is very, very dangerous because unless you get... Um, <laughs> unless you get some constructive criticism, you're never going to get any better. It's like somebody playing a violin and everyone's kind of got their fingers in the ears thinking, oh my God, are they going to keep doing this? And then they tell you it's lovely. It doesn't really help you improve. Um, and then actually Daddy Hoggy's put in there a really helpful quote. Everybody's <laughs> first draft is shit. You've already broken the rules, Daddy Hoggy. Come on, language, boy, language. Um, but no, it's, <laughs> it's a genuine quote, so that's fine. Uh, everybody's first draft is shit. So cop stop comparing yourself to what you see on the shelf. You've got to start somewhere. Is, is, is kind of the lesson that you've got to take away from that. It's very important to start somewhere and just get better because the best violinist in the world started off by squeaking their way through, you know, Frere Jacques or something. And the same with writing. If I look back at, you know, say this, this piece of archaeology here from when I was 13, um, not surprisingly, it is appalling. You know, from any critique, you know, perspective at all. There are plot holes, uh, Jewish sex machina, and we'll cover all these kind of cliche words anyway. Basically, I'm, you know, it, it's a bad plot, it's bad characters, it's bad writing. Everything is wrong with it, but it proves I started. That's why I keep it. Not because it's any good, but because I started and I kept going. And that really is all you need to do. Because you'll pick it up and you'll notice things along the way going, oh, did, I, did I used to do that? Um, and I say I've, this this link that I will drop in for you at the end of the um, the show. Um, <laughs> Chris Viking's the link off as well. Fantastic. <laughs> yep. Yes. Point finger. Yes. We're trying to keep the stream good for everybody, even you know, even if they're a little bit sensitive to uh, to, to that sort of language. So I've left the mature, and we've already discussed the word mature as being totally and utterly inappropriate for that. But anyway. Um, yeah, so um, just in case we've got people of all ages kind of accessing the stream with various different sins. But no, it's, you're quite right. It's in the quote, so that's acceptable. <laughs> you know, and, and Neil Gaiman, we can't argue with him, can we? Um, definitely not, because he's, he's, he's a master. But he'd, be, I'm sure, be the first to admit that he's still learning. So that, you know, that's, that's the thing. Uh, but you've got to keep going. And um, hello, um, hello, Garzini. I do love some of these names. Um, I'm very boring when I come to kind of using names. I just... Kind of call myself Drew, <laughs> but it's good. Um, so yeah, so um, um, you know, don't underestimate the fact that you've got a lot of work ahead of you if you want to be any good at all. Um, you've also got to not take the feedback personally. If somebody says your story is rubbish, and they will, and they won't necessarily be very kind about it because they've never met you, they never may never ever meet you. Um, you know, in the same way that you know, forum feedback can be brutal and, and, and nasty, uh, any kind of review of your work will, will quite possibly have the same. What you've got to do is you've got to kind of depersonalize it and go, okay, is there genuinely a problem with my what I've written? Because there probably, so at the, at the beginning, there will be. There will be a whole bunch of stuff that's not really all that good, and you're going to need to improve it. And some of it is quite hard to learn. So, you know, if I go back to my violin analogy, you know, most of us could probably get a note out of a violin, but getting something smooth and something where we can change finger positions quickly without, um, you know, causing a squeak um, and making a pleasing sound um, is, is uh, you know, is a, is a whole different league of uh, practice. Um, so, you know, you're going to have to, you're going to have to keep working at it. it. It does take some time, unless you're incredibly, incredibly talented and lucky. Uh, and to be honest, even if you are incredibly, incredibly talented, um, you will still get better. Um, I always say at work, I'd rather have hard-working people than talented people because talent, pe talent only gets you to the starting gate. It's hard work that gets you through and on to the end. So that's kind of my, uh, that's my learn. Um, so yeah, so you, you do need to apply yourself. You do need to apply yourself. Uh, I have heard that you're not really as successful, and again, quote, successful, unquote, because what does that mean? Um, but, you know, you're, you're not a proper writer until you've had a million lines, which means about six or seven books worth of critiqued work. Now, I don't know, that, that's just a statistic I've heard chucked out, um, but, um, you know, that, that's a number, and we can kind of analyse some of these in, in future streams and have a look at it. Um, so, you know, there's a, there's a thing. So you've, there's, there's, a, there's a big chunk of work ahead of you, 
and you know you'll need to get through that to, to <laughs> get good <laughs> to use a to use a gamer uh, a kind of um, quote there um, you've also got to ask yourself the question why now a lot of writers will say well, I, I can't help it I just got to and if if that keeps you going that's great I'm kind of in that category I would say because uh, every time I stop um, and I've got any kind of peace and quiet, I start thinking up stories and I start thinking up characters. It just seems to be almost instinctive for me to do that. And a lot of people will probably feel the same. So that's, um, that, that's, a, that's a thing. Um, and um, so the, the next piece on that is, um, you know, is it, again, going on the why question. What are you doing it for? If you're doing it because you know, you've no alternative, and, and the stories just keep coming out of your head, then, then great, you know, go with it. Just keep writing. Um, just keep writing. Um, if you're doing it for the money, um, be aware <laughs> it's not a lucrative profession at all, okay? Um, unless you're in that really, really top point zero, it's probably zero one or, or possibly even less percent, then um, you, are, you are not going to make a great deal of money. The, um, the ACL... S, uh, sorry, ALCS, um, Authorized Something Copyright Society, uh, Authors Licensing and Copyright Society. We'll go into some of those organisations as well because there's a few of them that are worth knowing. Um, recently published a blog about it and basically saying the average earnings for a writer is about £10,000 a year. Um, and given that's the average, um, that's highly skewed by the people at the top end like the J.K. Rowlings and George R.R. R. Martins of the world which means that the actual real average is even lower than that, which is not really <laughs> all that impressive. So uh, unless you get incredibly lucky, it's very unlikely statistically that you're going to make your fortune by writing books. Um, and that's, that's doubly a problem nowadays because the likes of Amazon uh, have made it an awful lot easier to get published because you can self-publish, you can do a whole bunch of other bits and pieces as well all of which are valid routes, but it does mean that everybody else is doing it. So the number of books out there that you're competing with for kind of eyeballs is, is going up all the time. And so, oh, and Daddy Hoggy's just chucked me in a stat there, which is median is three to four K per annum. So that's, that isn't very much. That's not going to keep you alive <laughs> unless you live somewhere very, very, very cheap indeed. Um, so, you know, don't expect it to be a... Um, you know, a career or anything. If you're going to write to try and live on it, I would think twice because that's very unlikely to be kind of viable. Um, and uh, Chris, um, uh, good. Uh, thank you very much for posting there. I mostly never show anyone anything I write. Now you've got to you've got to get around that one, fella. You've got to get around that one uh, because you will you will grow um, and and gain a vast amount of confidence if you can and you start refining your technique based on what other people are telling you. So I would definitely like to see some of your stuff on this stream at some point, if you're willing, um, and we'll see what you go. I don't want to put you in an awkward spot, but um, the, one of the best things I ever did was to write my first kind of... It wasn't a proper book, it was a fan fiction, but I wrote it in full spotlight on a forum. Um, Daddy Hoggy will know about this one. It was my first elite book um, called Status Quo, and that... Um, made a massive, massive difference to the quality of what I could achieve um, because I started getting feedback from people who were interested but weren't afraid of potentially hurting my feelings. So um, we'll, you know, we'll have an opportunity to do that sort of thing on the stream in, in future sessions. So um, let's keep an eye on that. But I definitely encourage you to get some of your stuff out there. We're not going to be, <laughs> we, won't be we won't be mean, uh, we won't be horrible about it. We're just going to give you constructive stuff. Um, and you know, there's loads and loads to learn, and you know the more you try, the better you'll get. You know, seriously, um, you know. And I will be policing this stream, so if we get any kind of abuse on it, then I shall ban people and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. But I'm sure we won't because um, you know, I hopefully will encourage you, you know, reasonably mature kind of view of this kind of stuff, and we will we will go from there. So I, I think you know a little bit of team critique on that will be really really good. So. Um, yeah, you know, I kind of mentioned, um, you know, the money. Don't do it for the money. Um, I would say from mine, I have been moderately successful. Um, I'm probably around that kind of media mark that Daddy, as Daddy Hoggy's mentioned there, uh, in total on a good year. 
Uh, and that's having written for a well-known franchise like Elite. Um, uh, and um, we'll have to wait and see how Lords of Midnight goes. Uh, and as obviously supplemented by my own stories. Lucrative, it is not. It is not a license to print money, no matter how far you get down it. Um, unless you do get lucky. There's, um, somebody has also quoted, um, there are three rules for uh, being an absolutely successful writer and earning lots of money. Unfortunately, nobody knows what those three rules are. Um, I don't know what they are. Nobody does. Um, some people will get lucky. They'll get optioned um, for a film or something like that, and there'll suddenly be a meteoric rise. Um, J.K. Rowling was in the right place at the right time with the Harry Potter series. Um, same with George R.R. R. Martin. And there will be another one. Um, you know, and good luck to them. Um, I'd love it to be me, <laughs> but so wouldn't we all. Um, so you know, don't don't rely on it. You've got to you've got you've got to do your own thing. You've definitely got to do your own thing. Um, so yeah, you know, the other thing is, you know, what rewards are there? Well, I get a massive kick out of bringing to life um, stories that I just have buzzing around in my head. So for those of you who know me, I'm a big fan of kind of 80s stuff. Um, and back then, there were lots and lots of cartoons like um, uh, Ulysses 31. So again, if you want to go and check these out, um, uh, they're, 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 you can find episodes of them on YouTube. Um, and uh, there, were the, the, there were cartoons like Mysterious Cities of Gold, uh, which is another fabulous one. Um, you know, I was reading at the time, obviously, Tolkien. Um, and McCaffrey's Dragon series and those kind of things. So that was the sort of staple stuff that I was getting in my head um, as kind of input. And my stories naturally started to kind of ape those kind of things. And I found writing, particularly when I was at school, as a you know a kind of escape valve, really, from the, the crappy days I had at school. Because <laughs> school in the 80s was pretty dire. Um, uh, well, I don't know how uh, school today may be pretty dire as well. I don't know how it compares. But um, I didn't really enjoy school i enjoyed some of it but um you know as a, uh, taken as a, as a whole i um i didn't fit in very well i was the geeky kind of nerdy chap and everybody around me was either into girls football or bikes and um i wasn't so um you know i i was very much a loner and to me i was quite happy with being a loner but um you know it, it wasn't you know for me i was i was glad to have left school um, but getting away from school Computer games and writing were the two things that kind of kept me interested in walking the dog, uh, which I, you know, I also love and still do. So, um, you know, writing, you know, was an outlet. Uh, it was a way to express yourself uh, in much the same way as an artist or musician would do the same sort of thing. So, <laughs> the comments there. Lona here as well, uh, and it was pretty dire in the 90s from Chris Viking. So, yeah, uh, and, and escaping it by reading books, which is great. Um, you know, reading obviously is a, is another part of it. So um, that's the other thing for, and that neatly, very, very, very good there, Chris. Well done. Uh, <laughs> most smooth um, is that um, um, y if you're going to be a writer, you need to be a reader. There's there's no way around that. You've got to you've got to enjoy reading because you're going to be doing a lot of it anyway of your own stuff to make sure it makes sense and works. Um, but you're going to need to get ideas and inspiration. And it's not that you're copying or you know, reusing other people's stories. Um, you, you need that inspiration. You need to go, oh, yeah, that's, you know, I'd like to tell a story a bit like that, but where this happens. Or um, you know, using the inspiration of something that just triggers your imagination and kind of gets you moving. Now, that was, for me, that original elite computer game back in 1984. It really kind of... Um, kind of woke me up to, oh, wait, wait, you, you can write stories about science fiction? I didn't know you could do that. Because, of course, in my English lessons at school, um, they, um, you, know, you had to write serious stuff and you had to do comprehensions on Shakespeare and all this kind of thing. The idea of writing something about science fiction was just, you know, it didn't happen. Um, so as a child, I just kind of, I was, I was amazed that you, <laughs> clearly somebody had written this and had been published and put in, a, you know, in the computer game. It suddenly, I suddenly realized that you could do this sort of stuff and it was viable. Um, so, um, you know, d definitely, definitely do that sort of thing. You do need to read. So um, if you're not voraciously searching at your next book, um, you may not be getting enough input in order to kind of be, have an output. And you need to have an output. You know, you need to kind of keep doing this sort of stuff. Um, um, it, does, it does take um, time. 
So from the point I started writing, I would say semi-seriously, would be about 2006. And that's when I started, uh, in fact, that's the year I met Daddy Hoggy, I think. Um, and we met on the Elite Forum, which is a, um, a tribute to the Elite game. And, um, you know, we had a, a love for the, the background lore as it was back then. And uh, we're always chatting about it. And um, at that point is when I started writing fan fiction. And I think fan fiction is, um, is, is, a, good, is, is a really good entree to you know, proper writing. Um, not to say fan fiction isn't proper writing, but you know, writing that you can then go off and do something else with. I, you've got the, the IP. The, obviously, the big problem with fan fiction is you can never sell it. Um, you're kind of building on somebody else's universe. Uh, but I would definitely recommend that as an approach if you're comfortable with it, because uh, it certainly worked for me in terms of just kind of starting out. Um, and the, one of the big advantages of doing that is that you've usually got a bunch of people who will give you a sympathetic ear, um, because they, you know, they're always hungry for more content in their chosen kind of area. And also, a lot of the background kind of world building is done for you. And by world building, I mean all the stuff that you need to have kind of already kind of worked out in order to have a novel that works. So um, stuff like that would be, um, you know, where, when, um, under what conditions. Are we, are we doing a historical novel where it's based in the real world? Are we doing a fantasy where it's based in a magical world? What, what are the rules of the magic? How does the magic work? Um, what does the landscape look like? Is there a map? Um, What's the immediate prehistory of where we are now? So the characters have got a bit of background. Are there any politics going on? All those sort of things. You, you need to have some of that in order to start your novel. I.e., what happened just before the novel started um, in order for you to be able to tell the story. Now, in fan fiction, so if you chose a genre like Star Trek or Star Wars or in the fantasy world, you know, Tolkien or, or anything along those lines, um, you can start with that environment already built. You've got a reference material you can go and look things up. So, for example, in, in Lord of the Rings, you, you would know Gondor, and you would know Mordor, and you would know the Shire, you'd know Mirkwood. You'd have a map, you'd have the geography, and so on and so forth. Um, no problem at all with you know, that background research. A lot of it's kind of done for you. And that, 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 for me, was a really, really good place to start with the elite stuff, because, of course, everybody knew what the spaceships were, and they knew how the guns worked and all that kind of stuff. So a lot of that world building is done for you. Now, it is great fun, at least I think it is, to do world building. But there is a danger that that's all you do. <laughs> um, many a writer has, 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 has created some beautiful maps of a fantasy realm, uh, worked out all the peoples and the politics, even worked out the languages and, and worked out all the, all the kind of geo-historical, political kind of construct of the society, but never written the book. And... Where's the output? Where's the thing that you're kind of pointing on? Now, if you just enjoy world building and it's fun for you, then that's, again, fine. Um, but again, do you want to be a writer? What's, what's your objective? So just kind of circling that back, we've, t we've talked a little bit about the money. Don't do it for the money. <laughs> <laughs> Unless you get really, really lucky. And then just say, hey, well, I made it. Um, don't, don't have too many expectations on the money. That's, that's not a good one. Um, do you want to just publish a book? Because a lot of people just do, you know, just want to, they just want to publish a book, um, and that's absolutely worthwhile. Um, you know, very few people do. It, it, it's said, uh, this is another cliche, um, that um, everyone has one book in them. I don't know if that's true or not. I, I don't actually agree with it personally. <laughs> um, and it's certainly perhaps a, not a book I would want to read, um, but um, you know, th that, that's the thing. Um, if, and if you really just want to say, I've published a book. Um, then, you know, maybe that maybe that's a reason for it. You know, some people want that kind of fame. You know, they want to be on chat shows and they want to be talking about, hey, I'm a I'm a novelist and I do this, this, and this. Some people would like it to, you know, it, it just sounds like a fun thing to do. That's very naive. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, I mean, no, it, it it can be fun, but you know, it's also an awful lot of hard work as well. So those those are the sort of things. Uh, that, that you know it, that might be in the in the background of that kind of stuff. So um, that's uh, you know those those are sort of things. Um, so my advice on that one is is just work out why. 
what what are you trying to achieve? Do you want to do you want to be a novelist? Do you want to just get your stories out of you know? For me, it is just I love writing stories, and I really enjoy the fact that I've got to a point where I can write something and I can publish it, and, and people will read it. I'm I'm not doing it for the money because um, it, it frankly <laughs> it just isn't enough. <laughs> So I've still got the day job, and that's one of the reasons why this stream is the, the time it is, because um, I, I can't do it any other time, because I'm, I'm in the office doing kind of really, really boring stuff, um, which unfortunately pays the bills, or well, fortunately pays the bills. Um, so, you know, if you've got a day job, I wouldn't recommend giving it up at all, because you're probably still going to need your day job in order to get, you know, keep things going. Um, you don't need too much to be a writer. Nowadays, a laptop is fine. You know, you don't need to buy any special software. You've probably got a copy of Word or a word processor or something like that. So, you know, that's, that's good. You know, that's all you kind of need. Um, but, um, um, you know, so the tools aren't, you know, you haven't got to buy any kind of expensive equipment. But what you do need is time. You need time to kind of actually do the writing, and you also need time to kind of improve on it. So so that's, that's kind of good. Um, so work out the why, and then work out, okay, well, if I'm going to do said thing, um, you know, work, working back from that, what do I actually need to do? Um, it is, you know, it, it's a thing. Um, and yes, you know, uh, if you haven't got Word, um, it came with my PC and I've always used it. I kind of use it at work, so I'm familiar with it. Open Office is absolutely fab. No problems with that at all. That's really, really good. And um, you can kind of get a lot of stuff from it. So, um, um, and LibreOffice, I think, is a different version of Open Office. And there's another recommendation for. Focus right. They haven't tried any of those, but we'll um, we'll keep those kind of going. <laughs> yes, we shouldn't. We probably <laughs> open source is good. Yeah, let's not let's not keep Microsoft going. He says with a Microsoft PC and a Microsoft Word processor. But there we go. So um, you know, don't underestimate it. Being a writer is is hard. It is you know can be pretty brutal at times because you can put an awful lot of energy in, um, and you know the payoff. What is the payoff? Is it is it seeing your book on Amazon? Is it seeing your book on a bookshelf? Is it getting some reviews? Is it just knowing that you did it and that's good enough for you? Um, you've got to make sure you balance the input into your life versus what you're giving out. Um, because writing a book can be hard work, emotionally draining, and you know pretty tough, which is why not many people finish it. Um, you've also so you know for, from that you need to have support either from friends and or family. They've, they've got to understand that you need time, you need space, and every so often you're going to be really grumpy. <laughs> because either you've got a bad, um, a, you know, a bad review or you know, you're stuck or whatever it happens to be. Sometimes it's just not going to work. Um, and if you are anything like me, um, you're probably going to be a little bit introverted, which means you're not all necessarily all that good at expressing how you feel about something. You're just going to sulk. So you need people around you that will either uh, just leave you be or will kind of pull you out of your soul. Now, I'm I'm fortunate that I have got a wife that doesn't let me get away with that, which is really annoying. <laughs> but it's also really healthy for me. Um, so, um, But after 23 years of marriage, she's pretty much got me figured out. So um, that's quite good. Um, and uh, I'm just watching the chat screaming up here. Uh, so is it safer? Uh, good question for Matthew here. Is it safer or better to write... On topics that you know deeply, or is it okay for authors to write broadly on any topic they want to? Okay, well that's a very good question. Um, this touches on the the the, the kind of cliche: um, write what you know. Um, I fundamentally disagree with that because um, <laughs> no, you're not helping, Daddy Hoggy. Stop it. <laughs> um, so no, the whole write what you know. I fundamentally disagree with it because. How do I know what it's like to fly a spaceship in the 31st century? I mean, no, I don't. And on any topic, how can you be an expert unless you're in it? And this this touches on a whole bunch of other bits and pieces. Um, um, you know, like um, how do you write female characters if you're a man, or how do you write male characters if you're a woman, um, with any degree of certainty that you're doing a good job? Or how do I write about medieval France in 1312 because nobody's ever been to medieval France in 1312? Um, you know, all I can say on that particular topic at this point, and we'll, we'll cover that in a bit more detail in the future, is write what you're interested in. And as a kind of addendum to that, um, write what you're interested in and prepare to research. So, um, for example, when I was um, 
writing my first book, it was um, you know, all, you know, about Christianity. Um, and it was actually very kind of evangelical, born again kind of Christianity. Now, um, I had some experience of that, having come to kind of get onto Anglican churches. But in order to kind of get inside the heads of that whole kind of movement, I went along to church and kind of watched. Um, and was <laughs> quite horrified at times, but, um, you know, some people seem to like it. And um, it, um, that was torn, yes, that's right. Um, so, you know, but in order to write from a fundamentalist Christian's perspective, I kind of had to get into a fundamentalist Christian understanding. I had to go in, and, and I was interested in it, genuinely. Um, you know, so I went along and sat at the back, and they tried to convert me. <laughs> and, you know, and, and those kind of good things. Um, very, very interesting. And, you know, a lot of sincere and well-meaning people I met through that process. And I was quite um, keen to you know, be able to do justice to the story I was telling. I didn't want to misrepresent that aspect of the story I was telling. Likewise, you know, I've been to plenty of sort of scientific conventions and those sort of things in order to kind of get uh, a handle on the good and the bad of you know, the opposite polarised community. Um, so write what you know. No, I think that's nonsense because how can you possibly experience a particular thing? Um, but if you're interested in it and you're prepared to do the research and you're prepared to balance out what you're writing about, I think that's perfectly valid. The same thing goes for fantasy. I mean, none of us live in a fantasy realm, so how can we write that? Um, it, it doesn't make any sense. But we can certainly imagine, we can certainly refine, we can certainly make it logically consistent with itself. Um, and, you know, we, we can do that. So I, d I don't think that um, is... You know, write what you know. I don't think that's a good piece of advice. I think it's perfectly valid to, um, to to do that. Now, to answer your question more specifically, topics that you know deeply or broadly on any topic they want to, go for any topic you want to as long as you're prepared to ensure that there's a certain amount of um, rigour to what you're talking about. People will pick apart um, badly you know, novels where, where the detail's been skimmed. So, you know, I've seen... Um, and if we go back to Elite for a moment, there were three Galantz novels that were written around the same time as the, the other authors that we had. And um, if I'm fair to them, they wrote good stories, but they didn't write good Elite stories because they didn't really get what Elite was. Uh, and they didn't get some of the vibe behind the game. They didn't get the importance of, you know, for example, Coriolis Space Stations or Lave or the Cobra Mark III or some of the the vibe behind the actual games that had gone before. They didn't know that stuff well enough, and those books were written so fast, they didn't have time to assimilate it. And surprise, surprise, those books have crashed and burnt. And that's from Galantz, which is the premier sci-fi publisher in the UK, um, who you thought would have got that right. Um, but there's a subtle distinction there in terms of going the extra mile to understand the, the, the source material. So, um, and, and, and the writers who did those books were perfectly respectable writers, absolutely nothing wrong with them. And they wrote good stories, but not good elite books. And there's, there's a subtle distinction there. So if you're going to write about a particular topic, be prepared to run into people who know a lot more about that topic than you do, <laughs> who may well give you a hard time if you don't get some detail correct. Uh, so that would be my warning to um, that. Um, the way I've kind of got around that, I mean, in elite, um, I was probably a little bit arrogant at the outset that I knew everything about elite. And probably from the original game, I did. But of course, then the Frontier and First Encounters came into the mix, and then the revised Elite Dangerous, and lots more law was generated. So I had kind of tried, had to keep up with it. Um, you have to do your homework. There isn't much alternative to that particular one. Um, so yeah, so um, if you do want to do it deeply, that's fine as well. But um, you know, again, make sure that you're not going so deep that it's dull. Again, you've got to kind of figure out what what sort of story you're talking about. You could write a non-fiction book, for example. You could be an expert in a particular field if that's what you want to do. That's a totally different thing. Um, it's something I've not actually tried. I've kind of worked on fiction. But um, again, um, in a fictional world, if you're going to write a historical fictional novel, let's say about the 1940s or the Second World War or something, you, know, you need to get the detail right there because if people see through it and go, he hasn't done his research here, you'll probably lose your audience pretty fast. Um, which in some ways makes science fiction and fantasy rather easier because you're making up the history and you haven't got to worry about anything else. So if your historical romance doesn't fit with um, established facts, you may be in for a, a little bit of a problem. 
Um, so those, those are the sort of recommendations I would kind of have in that sort of space. Um, just going back to one of the other questions at the beginning, authors who've inspired me. Okay, so this is a mixed bag. Um, so I'll rattle through the obvious ones. So you've got the science fiction folks, you've got the Asimovs, um, you've got the Edgar Rice Burroughs, you've got um, Clark, obviously. Um, you know, kind of the legends, <laughs> yeah, I suppose, um, in those kind of things. Now, um, Clark is a really good example. Love his science fiction, but he was rubbish at characters. He really was appalling. Um, and it, you know, he never claimed to be anything else, you know, fair play to him. But um, he couldn't write a character-driven story if his life depended upon it. That's not what he did. He was a great science fiction author. And if you like his stories, they're quite mechanical, they're quite technical, um, and, and in many cases, quite prophetic, obviously. You know, he, was, he was always seen as the prophet of the space age. Um, Asimov, very similar. Um, some really, really amazing kind of far-reaching um, you know, ideas. Um, you know, in, in sort of stuff that he did, but again, characters, not really, not really his thing. Now, on the flip side of that, um, my favourite author, um, in fact, the, the, the lady who wrote my favourite book, um, is um, Daphne du Maurier, who wrote the book Rebecca. Now, that's got nothing to do with fantasy or sci-fi. It's a sort of, sort of a ghost story in some ways, but it's not not really paranormal. Um, in the sense that the titular um, heroine, or antagonist actually, uh, is already dead <laughs> before the story starts. And it's the story of her impact after her life on the characters that remain. Um, but um, Daphne du Maurier is probably the, um, the, um, you know, the best character-driven story uh, I've ever read, and I, I, I haven't read anything else that's kind of caught up with it, in the sense that you've got this character, Rebecca, who's not actually even in the book, and yet you're kind of terrified of her influence on the characters that remain, because you see how she, who she was through you know, the actions that they kind of undertake. Um, so those are, those, those are fantastic. Um, the other person um, who really, really inspired me in terms of characterization was Anne McCaffrey. Unfortunately, both of these ladies are both dead now, which is really a shame. Um, but um, Anne McCaffrey was, um, you know, she's most famous for her Dragons of Pern series. And um, those are, again, amazing bits of characterization from my perspective. So you've got characters there who you really sort of dislike or root for or kind of admire or hate or kind of, oh, no, not them again, what are they going to do this time? You know, that um, they are kind of almost real people. You can get really involved with some of those characters and follow through their, their escapades over time and, and really kind of feel with them. So from a from a science fiction perspective, you know, we've got those kind of very technical kind of novels, which I do like. They do appeal to the, you know, the attention to detail. But in terms of characters, you know, those other two are, are, were big inspirations on me. Um, and, you know, there'll be lots and lots of art, you know, different ones that uh, which, which come through. Um, so um, I like a blend of those. I, I like the hard science fiction. I've, I've never tried to write a purely technical science fiction novel, actually, to be honest. Um, maybe I'll try that at some point in the future. I've, my, my own writing is, is very much all about um, kind of character stroke adventure stuff. Um, in, you know, in, in my Shadewood series, I've set it on a si hard science fiction world and worked out the rules for that. But um, those are the sort of things that... Um, uh, you know, are um, the way I like to do things. And that's kind of, I suppose, my writing niche that I'm kind of comfortable with and, and, and feel I can generate some, you know, some reasonable stuff with. Um, your mileage is going to vary, as they say, in terms of, you know, the other stuff that uh, that comes along. So those those are, um, you know, those are the things. I, you know, I definitely recommend you, you do invest some time in in the topic that you want to write about and make sure you're kind of really, really familiar um, oh, and a good question there. What's <laughs> oh politically charged? Well, out of interest, what is your favourite elite novel apart from your own? Um, that's quite hard. I'm going to go actually with um, the the anthology, Tales from the Frontier, because not that I like all of the stories in there, but there are some real gems that I'm thinking. Damn, I wish I'd written that one myself. Um, the the best one, I th well, actually there were t three that really jump out to me in that. Um, thing from the short stories. One's by Chris Jarvis, which I think is called Children of Zeus, which deals with the 
um, Discovery of a Generation Ship, which I think is really good. Um, there's the Silver Comet by Darren Gray, which is sort of um, ghostly, not quite ghostly, but kind of mystery. There's something going on. Um, we're not quite sure what it is. Um, story, which is also rather clever because the um, you know the antagonist is actually um, um, disabled, I think, which was a I think has a multiple sclerosis in the story, which I think is is a quite an interesting twist uh, to add in. So Darren did a good job on that. And the other one is, and I can't remember the title of it off the top of my head, by uh, and I'm going to get this wrong, Ula Suzumetsa, I think is correct. <laughs> <laughs> and I can't remember the title of her story, but um, it was set in the Empire about a thousand years before the... Uh, oh, was it Cerebral Palsy? Sorry, I, I knew it was something like that. That was it. Yep, thanks, Chris. Um, and Ula's story was set at about a thousand years before, and it kind of deals with the formation of the Empire, which I thought was quite an interesting stuff, kind of in the lore. So I would definitely recommend Tales of the Frontier. That was my kind of favourite one, other than the ones that I wrote. Um, so, yeah, that's good. Um, the others are great. Um, so um, you've got Alan Stroud's, um, I think someone's already mentioned it there, Labour Evolution. Um, that one was really, really strong. Uh, the, um, you know, the story of Lave obviously doesn't need much introduction because it's, um, um, you know, it was, the, it was the place where it all started from a perspective of the, you know, the space station you first saw as you kind of came out. Um, and the story of how that was a, um, a dictatorship and then wasn't a dictatorship. Blood is thicker. Chris, well done. That's it. Um, Kate's was um, was good fun. It's a, obviously a comedy, um, and John Harper's um, and and Hear the Wheel probably better for those of you familiar with kind of Frontier First Encounters and all that sort of stuff because it was set a little bit later. Uh, that was kind of good as well. So good fun. Yep. Um, was there another one? Oh, Out of the Darkness by um, um, T. James. That's it. Uh, so that was that was good as well. I did enjoy those kind of ones. So. Um, yeah, so overall, I mean, I, I kind of enjoyed all of them, really. But I think the Tales from the Frontier, the, the, the three stories I mentioned in there, the ones that kind of jumped out for me as kind of being, mm, yeah, those are good. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I kind of uh, kind of enjoyed those. So um, we are blimey, already getting to um, the hour mark, which I said I'd, where I'd kind of um, hold off. So um, let me just, because I haven't used my... <laughs> <laughs> just use, I've kept this screen up and we haven't used it at all this evening. Um, we will in future. Um, obviously, this is an, um, kind of the, the first stream and I wanted to kind of um, say hello to everybody and get things going. So those, hopefully you can see that on the screen, those are the sort of topics that I came up with in my blog. Um, so so you want to be a writer, what does it take? Um, we kind of covered that one this evening. Um, we've got world building. How do I construct something from scratch? Sort of writing cliches and we've covered a couple of those this evening. Um, fatal flaws, things not to do, um, how you create characters, how you do points of view, description, polishing, getting the book out there, so the, the whole publishing discussion, um, uh, and so on and so forth. Um, you know, what publishing options do you have? How much money can you actually make? So I'm planning on this one actually to kind of come clean with you guys. Um, I'm sure you're probably interested in, um, and I can give you a bit of a breakdown because I think there's a lot of mystique about this particular one is how much money can you actually make? Now, I would class myself as probably borderline reasonably successful, if that, <laughs> if that makes sense. Um, yeah, if you look at my Amazon page, um, you know, I've written a number of books. I'm not trying to show off here, and I know I really have to update this picture. That's about 10 years old, and I look much, much older now. Um, in fact, on the screen, I look a bit like a pointy-haired boss from Dilbert. I know, because I've got all these fluffy bits around the side and my headphones at the back. <laughs> but I'm the same guy, um, you yeah. know. Um, so, um, but you know, I've published some books, clearly. Um, I've published them for some well-known franchises. I've written some of my own stuff. Um, they are selling, as you can see. Um, they've got some reviews. Um, it looks kind of okay. What does that mean in terms of actual results? So I'm quite happy to kind of reveal as much of that as possible. We can go through that in the future stream. What does that, what does that actually mean in practice? Uh, you know, what is a good number of sales, question mark? Um, how do you know when you've got vaguely successful, all those kind of things. We can definitely go through that. Um, and oh, where's my blog gone? Um, so, um, and then writing in games. I'm, I'm sure some of you will be interested in that. What is it like to actually write things for a computer game, which is a completely different topic from just writing novels f about a computer game. Um, some of you may know I wrote some of the missions for Elite Dangerous. And while I can't reveal some of the internal workings of that, because it's still NDA, I can take you through a kind of generic sized version of it that would probably apply to pretty much any game 
uh, environment because they're going to share a lot of sort of things. So if you're going to write a mission for a computer game, what does that look like? And is that something that's interesting? And we can have a kind of breakdown through that. Um, and then writing you know, in someone else's universe. So if you're going to do that, well, we kind of touched on that a little bit as well. Uh, what, what does that sort of look like? And what I'd like to also do is use some actual real examples. So uh, what I have here, and I'm going to dump it in the chat so you can grab it, is one of my previous books or short stories. Um, and Daddy Hoggy will already know this one because he's probably read it. Some of you may have also found it over the years as well. Uh, I'm just trying to find out my list here. There it is. Um, so you should, if I dump this into the chat, you should be able to download this from my website. Now, this is a short story that actually inspired the Shadewood series. This is, I wrote it as a short story a long, long time ago. Um, what I've done here is I've tied it up a little bit put it in a PDF form for you to access. What I think would be fun um, is for you to download it and read it, and we'll bring it back next week and we'll go through what's wrong with it <laughs> as a kind of worked example. So I thought it's only fair if I'm going to potentially in the future critique some of your work, um, or you know, as a group we critique some of it, it's only fair that you can have a pop-up of some of my stuff. Now, bear in mind this is from 2010, so this is eight years ago. Um, there are flaws with it, and you know we can go through that as part of a, another session. So yeah, a little bit of homework. <laughs> it shouldn't take you too long. It's only about nine A4 pages, I think. Um, it, it sits before the Shadewood. So if you've read my, my Shadewood um, books, then you will kind of get the vague familiar. You'll see the same character name, actually. So you can see where I got the idea from. It's got a slightly elite feel to it, deliberately. Um, so if you, you kind of got elite in the back of your head at the same time, then um, you will notice, um, or at least you can you can juxtapose it if you if you so wish, um, and um, it's kind of a bit of a blend, a bit of a mash up, I suppose, of kind of religion, science, and spaceships, and that kind of good stuff. So, have a read of it. Uh, what we'll do is we'll bring it back next week, and um, we'll go through, and I'll take you through some of the stuff that is actually wrong with that story, um, because I've had eight years since I wrote it, in order to um, you know, go and look back and think, oh my god, did that really write like that? <laughs> <laughs> and you can see how much I've changed over that time, which hopefully give you a bit of inspiration to, um, you know, to, to, to kind of go through and maybe show some of your work. So if you are interested in having some of your work put up, and what I suggest we do is we, we take sort of short chunks. Don't, don't send me an entire novel, because we'll never get through that. Um, but maybe um, 100, 200 words or something. If you would like to volunteer some of your writing for the stream um, for us to go through, and we will go through it fairly and make suggestions. We're not going to go, ha, my God, I can't believe you did that. <laughs> that would be horrible. Um, yeah, we'll, we'll be fair. So, you know, if you're interested in doing that and you want to kind of contribute it, then um, let me know. You can catch me on Twitter and Facebook and all those kind of good things. I'm more than happy to accept submissions, but I thought it was only fair if I start with one of my own, one of my own uh, and kind of open it up for um, you know for critiquing. So um, feel free to read that in the next week. You know, uh, yes, setting homework, but you know, don't have to if you don't want to. Obviously, you, you can just join in. Um, but um, if you'd like to come back with your own critiques of it, let's discuss it. Let's pull it apart a little bit and uh, give it a hard time. And um, uh, oh, and Danny Hoggy, what have you said here? Um, Oh, and uh, hi, Gamora. Uh, thanks for dropping on the screen. Uh, with either, right, can I suggest the small chunks are either a bit you're proud of or a bit you're worried about? Yeah, that's a really good idea. So, yeah, so either send us a good piece or something that you really like or something that you're kind of trying to get to work and you're not entirely convinced you've got it right, and we'll, we'll give you some suggestions. We'll, t we'll take it apart and have a look at it. There's nothing like actually doing it to um, kind of get, um, you know, kind of get some of our creative juices flowing. Um, but let's start with one of mine. I think I'll put myself on the stake um, to start with, and uh, we'll pull apart one of my short stories, um, and um, we'll, we'll kind of go along with that. So the other thing, um, again, so ideas for future streams. So there's a few on there. The other things um, I kind of already mentioned, so the surgery idea, um, I think that will potentially have some, some legs on it. Let's give that a whirl, see if that works. Um, I'm potentially planning to do some sneak peeks. I know people like that sort of stuff. So um, if there's some upcoming stuff from my books that you're interested in, I might, I might chuck that in. Um, um, if there's any interest, we could potentially do some, some sort of readings as well. 
I don't want to overdo that because that could get boring quite quick. But um, if, if there's bits and pieces that potentially would fit in there, it might be good. Um, we may have some special guests. So obviously uh, there's a bunch of other writers that I know. We may get some of them on the stream and see uh, see what they have to say for themselves. Maybe do a little bit of interview Q&A on them. Um, and uh, we could potentially do some book reviews as well. So stuff that's kind of, yeah, we think this is really good. Let's, um, let's go and have a look at it. So it's kind of almost a writer's circle, but online <laughs> in some ways. Um, I must admit, I'd, I'd like to join the writer's circle, but there aren't any near me. So this is kind of my almost my alternative to it. So let's have a look at that. But th there's also other bits and pieces. So there's plenty of tools as well. So, uh, you know, you know, we talked about obviously the internet for doing research and we talked about Word and uh, Open Office actually for doing the writing. Um, there are other bits and pieces. So here's a good example um, of a really handy tool that we can go through at some point. We just fire it up. Uh, is it? Oops, starting on the wrong monitor. There we go. So this is um, a really useful um, tool. This is Kaliba, which is a free tool for turning your Word document into an ebook. Uh, and we can go through ebook formats and all that kind of good stuff as well. So there's lots of little bits of mechanics and tools that are around there um, to use. The other one that um, I've used an awful lot, I find really good for, he says this is going to just test that he's got his OBS working properly, is um, something like Space Engine. So Space Engine is a kind of galaxy simulation, I suppose. Um, with In terms of graphics fidelity, it's very similar, or possibly even better than um, Elite Dangerous in terms of what you can see um, and the kind of graphical effects that you have. Just uh, we're almost starting up. Hopefully you can see that in the background here. Um, and there's, a, there's a fake bit of music as well. Um, so the beauty of Space Engine, of course, comparative to Elite, is that you're just free to roam anywhere. So if I want to go and have a look at a planet and, and kind of take some screenshots or just do some homework about a particular type of stellar environment, um, then, then you know, I can. Um, and um, as somebody's already pointed out, you know, if we want to go somewhere, we just kind of click on it, and we're there. It doesn't. We don't have to spend six billion years hyperspacing um, across the galaxy. We can just kind of go there instantly. Um, so we have this a, a, a nice ability to kind of get some inspiration from some of those sorts of tools. Uh, and as we close on this one, let's just see if we've got anything interesting we can go to. Uh, there are some planets around. Uh, Check that one. So I'm living up to my Twitch thing here with a little bit of kind of gamey stuff at the end. Uh, so, you know, here's a planet. Um, this is an airless rocky moon with a few asteroids in orbit. But um, because we've got complete control, we haven't got to worry about the actual mechanics of space flight here. Uh, we can, um, you know, we can get close to the surface and we can adjust our view and we can just hold position and we can use our WASD keys to kind of move up and down and so on and so forth. So this is quite a useful tool for, you know, uh, you know kind of getting some inspiration of landscapes and, and getting some eye candy and all that kind of good stuff. Now, the beauty of Space Engine, which I've used to quite good effect of some of my promotional material, which is, again, another topic we can cover, um, is that um, you can heart, you can program, if you knew a little bit of XML, um, then you can actually program your own worlds into the, the simulation. So I've been able to recreate the world on which my Shadewood books are set in actual simulation inside Space Engine, which allows me to go there, stand on the surface, and kind of figure out things uh, that I want to do. Um, and the, the nice thing about Space Engine, again, if I just go back out a little bit here, is there is inside it a, um, uh, an editor which means that I can edit things like video capture, the camera path, the skybox, uh, but I can also edit the planet, which is extremely useful um, if you want to create an environment. So you know, what I've been able to use that for is create a, a complete planet, create all the landscapes on it, the, the effectively the map, and then use that as the basis for my novels, which is an extremely powerful thing to do, which you, you know, years ago was just impossible to do. Um, and you can, if you want to, put spaceships in there and all sorts of stuff, and then you can share it with other people and so on and so forth. So it's a really, really cool tool for, for doing that kind of stuff. So that, that could be a future um, episode as well. It's, it's a very, very good tool. But again, from the perspective of writing rather than just what the game actually does or the simulation. And I'm not sure what Space Engine actually is, whether it's a game or a simulation or kind of a combination of both. But it's very cool, so I like it. There's other bits and pieces. The... Um, the um, 
there's another one called Ter no, not Terraria. That's a game. Um, Utera, which is a life-size realistic model of the of the of the Earth minus kind of civilization. That is a very useful tool as well. Um, and certainly f in, for me, in for the astronomy, just a, the standard um, a planetarium software Stellarium here uh, is also useful for for doing various bits and pieces as well. So he says, waiting for that to start as well. Seems to have got stuck. Oh no, it's there, but it's popped up, not in windowed mode. Very helpfully, there we go. So I'm sure you've seen something like this before, where you can um, advance time and so on and so forth. Um, and you know, we get a realistic view of the night sky, which is which is jolly handy. So there are a lot of tools out there that can give you, um, you know, a, a useful thing about writing and, and I'm sure you've got more ideas as well in terms of the sort of things that you can use to do your research other than just obviously the internet. If you're doing science fiction stuff, tools like that are really, really handy. Um, and there are lots of other bits and pieces in terms of things like fantasy stuff as well. So to whet your appetite for the sort of stuff that is coming up, um, one of the things I do want to take you through, which I think will be quite interesting for those of you who have followed my Elite Dangerous work, is that on my disk here, um, I do have, and apologies, I've got two monitors. <laughs> one of them is here, <laughs> one of them is there. <laughs> so when I'm looking over here, I'm not being deliberately awkward, I'm just looking over there because that's where my monitor is. Um, so uh, here we have my Elite Dangerous work, and you can see I'm actually, I actually did have three concepts for, for, for future novels. Um, they're still concepts, so I'm not doing anything with them right now, but you know the possibility is still there. Um, in Elite Reclamation, you can see here's the amount of work that I did in terms of all the other bits and pieces that are around there. Um, but I will take you through the, where is it? Uh, can't find it now. Uh, the, is it the research? So this is the research I did for Elite. You can see there's an awful lot of stuff in here that I had to kind of notice down. I'm just looking for my guidebook uh, that I wrote. I don't think it's in that folder. I should have had this prepared earlier. Apologies for this. Uh, where's the actual design document? Did, did, did it talk amongst yourselves for a moment? I will find it. Uh, boom, 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 boom. It's not that one. That's the actual other stuff. Uh, plot and approval it must be in there. There we go. So this document here is the document that I eventually sent to um, Frontier for approval way back in 2000 and uh, when was it? Um, 2011, uh, 2013, I think, um, which is the document that I put together to explain to Frontier what my novel was about and what was going to happen, what I needed in the game uh, to make it occur, um, and um, any changes that, you know, because obviously the game was still being designed at um, that point. Oh, uh, sorry, Chris. Uh, the, the, I'll type it in the chat because it's U Terra, which is spelt like this. There we go. So look that one up. That's worth a download. Uh, so yeah. So this this document here is basically the document that Frontier sort of signed off on to say yes, we are happy that you write a book in the, that criteria against the Elite Dangerous game. And what it will give us is, or hopefully give you, is a view to. Um, you know, the kind of background level of research that I did in order to write Elite Reclamation. Um, I can't do the premonition one, I'm afraid, because <laughs> there's still stuff there which is NDA, whereas Reclamation is now old enough that um, everything that's referenced in it is effectively old hat, so um, we can kind of go through that one without any, any potential issues. Um, so, you know, that, that information is in there. Um, and we can go through that. Now, this is not a small document, so there's a whole bunch of stuff in there which will potentially be of interest to, to viewers. But there's also a, a document that I put together to help me write the book, which was important for, for, for me as well. So it sort of shows you some of that kind of planning bits and pieces as well. Uh, so that's all for future stuff. So I am going to stop at that point. Thank you very much for your um, attendance tonight. It's been really, really good to see so many of you in the chat really appreciate that thank you very much for the support on my first ever stream i hope that worked okay um lots of topics coming up so i will endeavor to kind of do a little bit of an agenda of those so you can kind of tell what's going on i will be publishing this on youtube 
And I'm also going to look into how to um, turn it into a podcast for people who can just listen to the audio. Um, I've got to bear in mind that you know, people will want to listen to an audio, so um, trying to make sure I stream it in the sense that, um, you know, if you're listening to an audio, it makes sense without any kind of visual representation, which actually for this evening is probably absolutely fine because I've hardly done anything on the, on the video at all. But uh, in future lessons, that may be a little bit more tricky. But we'll see how it goes. We'll see how it goes. Um, so, again, thank you um, uh, to everybody who's kind of watched uh, this evening. I really appreciate that. Thank you very much. It's kind of felt reasonably natural, actually, which has been good. Um, and I've, you know, I've definitely enjoyed it. Um, thank you. It's been interesting. That's great. Thank you, guys. Really, really appreciate that. Um, if you've got any requests, um, then obviously just tweet or email or Facebook or any of those kind of things. I'm sure you guys know how to find me. So any suggestions for future stuff, I will write them down. Um, and if there are any questions that I missed in the chat um, you know, along the way, then again, send them to me. It wasn't by intent. <laughs> just, I was probably waffling on about something else. So... Um, uh, we're good uh, on that one as well. Again, shout out. Thank you very much to Chris Viking and Suriel. Uh, I haven't seen him actually on the stream this evening. Maybe he's busy. He was he, Every time I was firing up a test stream, he was there. <laughs> Just like he was stalking me. It was quite strange. Uh, but he did give me some tips. And Chris has also been helpful as well. Um, just to get me some of the stuff going. But it appears that it kind of worked reasonably um, uh, okay, which is great. Um, and thank you very much, Bograt. Yes, we'll definitely see you next time. So again, appreciate all the support, guys, for this kind of inaugural session. And I will see you anon for the next one. So same time, same place, uh, 8 p.m. on Mondays. And um, I will let you know what the topic's going to be uh, for the future. That'd be great. So anyway, um, I, need to come, I, I need to come up with some natty sort of sign-off. And I can't use right on Commander anymore. <laughs> <laughs> gonna have to come up with something else. So suggestions on the postcard. What's the sign-off phrase I should be using? Something, something imaginative that's vaguely naff. Um, and uh, we'll, we'll go from there. So that's good. So uh, yeah, it'll be available on Twitch shortly. I'm sure. I don't know how long that process takes to to pop up, but um, it won't be too long. And I'll once I've got it, um, I've been recording this directly to my laptop as well. So um, I'll um, upload it to YouTube ASAP. Um, thank you very much. Oh, and uh, that's nineties kids. Uh, Never mind, fella. You can you can catch up on YouTube or on Twitch in a moment. And um, thank you very much for coming along, even if you just turned up <laughs> for shutting down. <laughs> but never mind. Um, that's good. Oh, and um, oh, I've got my first live on the screen follower. Firebrand Mako is now following. Anyway, thank you very much. I will sign off and let you get back to your evenings. Thank you very much again, and see you next week.